uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our uh, guest speaker today. It's uh, David, uh, David Wu from the University of Texas at uh, Austin. There he was, he's going to talk about uh, practice based uh, uh, topic, taxing uh, vector polynomial and functional commitments from lattices. And this is a, a common work with for the QE and David Wu. It, uh, screen is yours, David. Great. So thanks a lot for the introduction and thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very happy to, to talk to you today about some of our recent work on functional commitments. Uh, I would have liked, really liked to be there in person, but uh, you know, uh, I think giving a Zoom talk is, uh, is perfectly, uh, hopefully a, a good, reasonable substitute. All right. So yeah, so let me, let me introduce the main notion that we're going to consider in this talk which is the notion of a cryptographic commitment. So just to remind you, if you have not seen this before, a cryptographic commitment is essentially an analog of a sealed envelope. So a user, let's say Alice, is able to uh, place a message within an envelope and send it over to Bob. At some later point in time, Bob is able, Alice can then over, open the envelope and reveal the committed message to Bob. So a more precisely, a cryptographic commitment scheme consists of the following algorithms. There's a commitment algorithm that takes in the input, uh, which is the message. Let me make sure, let me get the highlighter. It takes the, it takes the message X and produces a commitment and possibly some commitment state. So this is the analog of putting the message into the envelope and sealing it up. Uh, in this talk, I'm only going to consider non-interactive commitment schemes. So in addition to the input message, the commitment algorithm will also take as input a common reference string. Uh, for this talk, the common reference string will actually be a structured string. So take the structured string, take hit X, and produce a commitment and possibly some commitment state. Then uh, there's an opening algorithm that basically takes the commitment state and provides an opening to the envelope. So you want to check that the commitment is to a particular message, there's an opening algorithm uh, that produces that proof. Finally, uh, to check that the opening is indeed valid, we have a verification algorithm that takes the commitment, the statement, and the proof, and decides whether uh, the opening is valid or not. Uh, so for the basic <laughs> notion that I have, oh, sorry, what's your question? No, no. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions, uh, and I'll try to monitor the Zoom uh, as well. Sure. So, so alternatively, uh, we could have defined the framework to have the open and the verification algorithm be a single algorithm. Uh, the reason that I am basically just have open output, sorry, have the commitment algorithm just output sigma and pi together, and then verification takes in the commitment and the proof. Uh, defining these to be separate will actually be useful when I introduce the extension to functional commitments. So that's coming up uh, shortly. So the security requirements, I'm going to forget about the correctness for a moment. The correctness requirement just says, if I commit to X and I open, then the opening and the commitment will actually verify. So I'm not going to define that formally on the slide, but there is a implicit correctness requirement. The security requirements are usually twofold. So the first security requirement is binding, which basically says once you have committed to a particular message X, no efficient adversary should be able to open that commitment up into two different messages x0 and x1. So the adversary should not be able to come up with a proof pi0 for x0 and a proof pi1 for x1, such that both of them verify. So once you have chosen the commitment, there's only one possible value that you can open it to. So this property is <laughs> referred to as binding. A second property that oftentimes uh, we'll consider uh, is hiding which basically says that the commitment is, should hide, also hide the underlying message. So once I put the message into the envelope and give it to you, if the envelope is sealed, you should not know what message uh, I sent. And formally, this is defined by requiring an analog of let's say semantic security, where a commitment to some message X zero is computationally or possibly statistically indistinguishable from a commitment to a message X one. So the focus of this talk, though, will actually be on the generalization of cryptographic commitments, not just to the notion that I defined before, but to the notion of functional commitments. 
So this is a setting where I want to commit to a message, let's say a message X. And instead of just opening to the message X, I actually want to open the message or open the commitment to an arbitrary function evaluated on the message itself. So the way that I'm going to define that syntactically is I'm going to augment this open algorithm that I defined previously to not just take the commitment state, but also some additional function f. And uh, the open algorithm will still output an opening exactly as before. But now this opening is defined with respect to the function f. It's not an opening to the message itself, but an opening to a function f evaluated on the message. So if you're familiar with the notion of functional encryption, this is essentially the analog of functional encryption for the setting of commitments. I commit to X and I open to an arbitrary function evaluated on X. Uh, correspondingly, the verification algorithm now takes in a pair. Uh, it takes in a function F and then a purported value. And it basically decides whether the opening pi here is a valid opening of the commitment to the value Y with respect to the function F. So the correctness requirement should be if I commit to X and I open to F, then the opening for F will be a valid opening for Y equals F of X. Uh, and the binding property says that once I have chosen my commitment, I cannot open it to any, um, to two distinct values with respect to the same function. So notice here uh, that the opening, bind the binding requirement says once I have chosen my commitment, I cannot produce uh, openings pi zero and pi one to y zero and y one for distinct values y zero, y one with respect to the same function f. So once I have chosen my commitment for every choice of function f that you can define, there's only one possible way that I can open up that commitment. So any questions about this notion? So the idea, again, the, the basic primitive is commit to x, open to f of x, and the binding property is once I've chosen my commitment for every choice of function, there's only one value that I can open it to. Okay. So, oh, was there a question? No? Okay. All right. So the second property, the other properties that we'll consider is uh, for some of our constructions, uh, we'll be hiding, which says the commitment together with the opening they hide all information about X other than what is revealed by F of X. And you can formalize this by saying that basically the commitment and the opening can be simulated given only knowledge of the function F together with F of X. It does not reveal information about all of X. The major requirement in a functional commitment though is the efficiency requirement or succinctness, uh, which at a high level is saying that the commitment and the openings should both be short. So what does short mean? In the case of the commitment, it means that the size of the commitment should be polynomial in the security parameter lambda. The lambda here will denote the security parameter, but importantly, polylogarithmic in the length of the input X. So I ha might have a very long input X, but once I commit to it, I get a very, very short commitment to it. Okay, so that's the first requirement. That the commitment has actually size that is polylogarithmic in the length of the input X. The second requirement is that the openings should also be short. Uh, in particular, I can open a commitment to x to any value f of x with an opening whose size scales also polynomially with the security parameter, polylogarithmically with the length of the input, and I do allow it to scale polynomially in the length of the output. So I have a function that has, it takes a very long input and produces from it, uh, if, if, let's say a single bit output, then the length of the opening should only scale polynomially with the security parameter and polylogarithmically with the input length. So, so these are the these are the main requirements uh, on a functional commitment. So there's a very related notion which I'll mention later on in this class in this uh, in this talk, which is on homomorphic commitments, which has a very similar syntax just without the succinctness requirements. It only requires that it's binding, possibly hiding, uh, but does not require succinctness. So the difference between functional commitments and homomorphic commitments is this additional requirement that the, that the commitment and the openings be very short. So everything is compressing. Okay, 
So let me, before I move on to the construction details, let me tell you a few uh, case, special cases of functional commitments that you may have encountered before and which has received extensive study. Uh, so the first notion is a vector commitment scheme. So this is a setting where the input is a vector. I'm going to commit to a vector of values, x1, x2, up to xn. And then what I want to do is I want to be able to open to a particular index. So let's say I want to open an index i. The function is basically the index function that just takes the vector, has the index i hard-coded inside it, and just outputs the component at the desired position here, component xi. Uh, so this is one special case of a functional commitment for the particular case of index functions. A second notion that uh, has uh, encountered a lot of applications in recent times is the notion of a polynomial commitment. Uh, so the idea here is you commit to the coefficients of a polynomial. So imagine that alpha zero up to alpha d, they define a degree d polynomial. And when I open, I'm evaluating a polynomial at a particular point x. Uh, so the function that I care about is exactly uh, the linear function that takes the inner product between the coefficients of uh, the polynomial and the powers of the polynomial. So this is another uh, commonly uh, used uh, notion. So the reason that uh, functional commitments and specifically their specializations to vector commitments and polynomial commitments have been useful or have been extensively studied recently is because of their close connection to a succinct argument system. So here I want to give you a brief segue and say what the connection is, and this will also provide another way of viewing what a functional commitment is all about. So in a succinct argument system, our goal is to prove that some statement X is true, uh, where true means membership in some MP language. So the way that I can use a functional commitment to construct a succinct argument, so construct a primitive for this particular task is as follows. What I'm going to do is as, a, as the prover, I'm going to start by committing to the MP witness, so the witness for X being true, and that will give me a commitment. And then I will simply open to the MP relation that has X hard coded inside it. So the MP relation will take the witness W and decide whether W is a valid witness for X or not. So notice that this is a function that is known also to the verifier. So the verifier knows the MP relation, it knows the statement, doesn't know the witness. Uh, so the proof that X is contained in a language simply consists of a commitment to the witness W together with an opening to the MP relation defined by X. In this case, the proof consists of a commitment and the opening, and the succinctness of the functional commitment scheme states that the size of the commitment and the size of the proof, those are going to scale polynomially with the security parameter and polylogarithmically with the length of the input, the length of the input being the witness here. Notice that in the case of the MP relation, we only output a single bit. So uh, the fact that the size of the opening scales with the number of output bits uh, actually does not is irrelevant here. Notice though that to prove that this is sound uh, that this is actually a sound proof system, we actually will have to rely on a stronger version of binding, which I did not define in the previous uh, slides. But it's pretty it's uh, it's basically a knowledge or an extractable version of the binding uh, security notion. Uh, this is not the notion that's going to be satisfied by our work. That's not provably satisfied by our existing constructions. Uh, but could be conjectured at a heuristic level uh, to satisfy these notions. Uh, and so the more general way that you can view a functional commitment then is that they're providing a succinct proof on committed data. So namely, I can commit to some input, and then later on, I want to prove that my committed <laughs> input satisfies some property. The way that I can do that is uh, by giving an opening under the functional commitment scheme for the property that you care about. So this is another way that you can view a functional commitment is really a proof system for committed data. So functional commitments have been very extensively studied uh, over the course of the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, in fact, the very first vector commitment scheme uh, is the classic cons uh, construction of a Merkle tree. So this was uh, back at the very, uh, very, very early days of cryptography. Uh, and in the subsequent years, uh, especially in the last decade or so, excuse me, there has been a lot of work on developing algebraic constructions of uh, vector commitments, polynomial commitments, and very recently, uh, functional commitments for uh, general computations. 
So I should mention here that uh, if we care about general computations, so namely functional commitments for the class of all Boolean circuits, uh, previously we can do this using collision resistant hash functions and succinct non-interactive arguments of knowledge. Uh, so this gives a feasibility result for the existence of uh, functional commitments for all functions. Unfortunately, it does require fairly strong assumptions. It, in particular, it requires a succinct non-interactive argument of knowledge, which is uh, a fairly strong primitive that uh, can only be based on either idealized assumptions like random oracles or on uh, non-falsifiable knowledge assumptions. Uh, so an interesting question is whether we can try and build uh, uh, functional commitments for general functions that do not require knowledge assumptions. Namely, can we do it from falsifiable assumptions? So previously, this was known for the case of linear functions and constant degree polynomials, but it was still open how to get it for, our, for general circuits. Uh, so in this work, uh, we make progress along these lines use, uh, 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 using lattice-based assumptions. So our first construction is a new vector commitment uh, from lattices. So in particular, uh, hardness reduces to the standard SIS or short integer solutions problem. And then uh, this particular construction in, in comparison to the previous ones actually has several appealing properties which will become clear later on in this talk. For instance, we can support, uh, we get hiding properties for free. We can actually commit to large values uh, in contrast to previous lattice based construction. So I'll talk a little bit more about some of these properties later on in this talk when I introduce the general framework we use for constructing lattice based vector commitments. Uh, but more interestingly, our framework that we introduced actually directly generalizes beyond vector commitments to give us a construction for all Boolean circuits. And the catch here is we have to rely on a new kind of lattice assumption, which I will introduce later on in this talk. But this is basically something that we call a structured uh, basis assumption. It's a new falsifiable assumption over lattices. I view it as a cute height extension to the SIS assumption. And this I will describe much later on uh, today. So what I want to do to first is start by introducing our framework for constructing lattice commitments. Uh, and the framework that I described here will be a generalization of previous lattice-based functional commitments by due to Piker, Payton, and Sharp, as well as Albrecht uh, et al. Uh, from crypto last year. So this will be a general framework that encapsulates the existing approaches. And then I'll talk about how we uh, operate within this framework uh, to construct our uh, vector and functional commitments from lattice assumptions. So in these constructions, uh, of vector commitments uh, from lattices, the common reference string will consist of the following uh, sequence of matrices. So there's going to be uh, one matrix for each bit of the input. So for now, uh, for simplicity, let's consider a vector of dimension L. So I'm trying to construct a vector commitment uh, for vectors of dimension L. And you can think of the each component of the vector as a, an element over Z cube, okay? Uh, as it turns out, we will require that these elements be short, uh, at least for the first instantiation of the framework. So the frame, the C common reference string for the functional slash vector commitment construction will have L matrices, one for each bit of the input or one for each component of the vector. It will also have a collection of target vectors, T1 up to TL, again, one for each component of the vector. Uh, for now, uh, don't worry about the distribution on any of these quantities. Uh, I'll talk about the distribution on these quantities later on uh, when we describe functionality and security. Okay, so basically right now for every component of the vector, we have a matrix and we have a target vector. So AI and TI. And finally, we will have this auxiliary data and this auxiliary data will consist of what I call the cross terms. Uh, so these are retargeting uh, vectors. So the main relation that I want from these cross terms is that I multiply A times UIJ, I will target that J target vector. So I start from the ith matrix and I hit the J target vector for I is not equal to J. So I only give out these cross terms when I is not equal to J. So I can target AI to any of the TJs. I cannot target AI to TI, however. Okay, and the notation I'm going to use to denote this is this AI inverse. So when I write AI inverse, this does not mean a matrix inverse. In fact, A is a, is a rectangular, very wide matrix. So the matrix inverse does not exist. What I'm, what I'm denoting here is that it's a short, uh, let's say Gaussian 
uh, pre-image. So this is a pre, this is a short pre-image of AI uh, that targets TJ. So it's just a short solution to this linear system here. This will be the key equation underlying our construction, underlying our framework. So once I have defined these objects, uh, now I will define how do we construct a commitment and the openings. So the commitment to a vector x here is just going to be a linear combination of the target vectors, where the coefficients of a linear combination is exactly the coefficients of i vector. So if I'm committing to x, then my commitment is just the sum of xi ti. So notice that this is a short vector. This is compressing, right? I took a uh, I took a vector of length l and I compressed it into a single vector uh, of lattice dimension, right? Which is security parameter. Suppose now that I want to open at a particular component. So for a moment, forget about opening to an arbitrary function. Let's just say I want to open to uh, the component at index i. So <clears throat> what that means, or what the opening relation is, is I need to produce a short vector v sub i, such that a i times v i plus y times t i is equal to c. So if I want to open the con to component i, I'm going to take the i matrix and the i target vector and check that the commitment satisfies this opening relation. So the opening is to come up with the short v sub i that satisfies this relation here. The question now is, how do you come up with such a v sub i? This is where we're going to use the cross terms. So the honest opening, uh, we'll, we'll see, will simply consist of all of the xj's times uij's for j not equal to i. So let's see why this works. If I multiply ai times uij, Notice that I'm basically retargeting to the j target vector. So what that means is if I just write down ai times vi plus xi times ti, that's my opening relation, I'm going to get ai times uij, which we call, observe just retargets to the j target vector. And so I end up just simply getting a sum of all the xi ti, which is exactly my commitment here. Uh, and moreover, notice that this is short because the uij's are short, and I'm going to assume now that the x's are small. So for this is the reason that in the previous constructions of uh, Piker, Payton, and Sharp, as well as Elbrick et al., uh, they only support commitments to short uh, values. Uh, they uh, it's because the opening is, cons is constructed by taking a linear combination of the committed vector and these short vectors in the common reference string uh, so as long as the commitment values are, are short, then the opening is also short. Okay, so any questions about this framework or this construction? Okay, great. So <clears throat> let me now mention then uh, how these vectors and matrices are instantiated. So in the construction of Pycard, Pepin, and Sharp, uh, they sample the matrices A to be uniform random, the target vectors are also uniform random, and this instantiation suffices to give vector commitments from the SIS assumption. So this basically gives you vector commitments from short integer solutions. Uh, the more recent construction of Elbrick et al. from crypto last year, they actually replaced the matrices A and the vectors T with structured uh, matrices. So in particular, AI has the form of WI times A. So A here is a still a very wide matrix. So let's say it's n by n log q in dimension. And wi is actually a random square matrix. So all of these matrices are actually uh, correlated uh, with each other. They come from a, uh, <clears throat> from a set that has negligible density uh, of matrices. And similarly, the target vectors also have this wi uh, multiplied with them. Okay. So these are using structured matrices and structured targets. And it turns out that this structure is actually very useful. This structure allows them to construct a functional commitment for constant degree polynomials. However, because they're using structured matrices rather than random matrices, they require hardness of a new assumption, uh, a generalization of SIS uh, called uh, the crisis assumption. So uh, the KRISIS assumption. Okay, so this is just uh, a brief summary or a brief way that you can view uh, the previous constructions. Uh, sorry, David, can you briefly elaborate on this new assumption, on the crisis assumption? 
knowledge assumption. Yeah, yeah. So at a very, very high level, uh, it basically says that SIS with respect to the matrix A here is still hard, even if uh, I give you uh, these uh, this auxiliary data. So I give you some uh, short pre-images under A sub I. Does that make sense? So uh, yeah, so basically it's SIS is hard, even though I give you some short pre-images of structured values. So if I just give you short pre-images of random targets, uh, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, affect the hardness of SIS because you can simulate those yourself. Uh, but in the crisis assumption, you're given short pre-images of uh, structured points. So these WI UIs. Thank you. David, yeah. I have a question. So is this, are these terms UIJ fixed? Like are there, are there data, do you need a trap dog to pre-sample this from time to time? Ah, yeah, yeah. So how are these sampled? Right. <clears throat> so uh, these will be sampled in a setup process. So in a setup process, uh, what you'll typically do is you'll sample a trap row for A, uh, and then you can sample uh, everything else uniformly at random. And then using your trap row for A, you can sample these uh, the cross terms in your auxiliary data. Uh, but once uh, you have sampled these, these are fixed as part of the CRS. So you do not need a trap row uh, later on. So this is a one-time setup process. Once it's done, uh, you can just publish these the, the short pre-images and run the system. But it does require this initial trusted setup to sample everything. So potentially you can just start with some small UIJ and construct TI by multiplying AI with UIJ. Uh, not quite, right? Because uh, the, the, oh, okay. Yeah, so if I think for the linear case, you can do that. When you generalize to constant degree polynomials, there's even more structure. So you actually won't be able to do that anymore. Oh, so I think right. for the linear case that, I'm, that I wrote down here, uh, what you're describing works. But in, uh, in a higher degree case, uh, there's even more correlations between the targets, so they're not uniform random anymore. Okay, so yep, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So I think for the linear case, it's a little bit deceptive in a sense that uh, uh, there's it seems like there's less structure, but there's more correlations as you go to degree two, degree three, and so on. Yep. Okay, so now let me tell you about our approach for uh, constructing vector commitments and functional commitments. So this is the uh, this is our framework. And basically, our framework is almost start backwards. Start at the very end and look at this verification invariant. Right? So the verification relation that we want is for all components i in the vector, the commitment is uh, equal to a times v plus x i times t i for some short opening v sub i. This is exactly the verification relation oops, that I wrote down in the previous slide here. Right? I'm going to start with this as our verification relation. And this should hold for all indices i up to l, uh, from 1 to l. Right? We should be able to open to any index of your choosing. So what we're going to do is we're going to write down this verification invariant as a linear system. The linear system basically uh, looks like the following. So if you look at the i row of this linear system, you get a i times v i minus c uh, is equal to minus xi ti, which is exactly the same relation that I wrote down here, just uh, moving certain things uh, to the other side of the equation. Uh, here, I'm just using i to denote the identity matrix. All right, so so far, I haven't done anything fancy. I've only written down, I basically just wrote down the whole system as a linear function. It turns out, though, that uh, for, for both security and functionality, we'll actually want to rewrite the commitment C here in terms of its binary decomposition. So basically, we're going to apply the gadget matrix uh, to C. So this is a common, common thing that's used in lattice space crypto. Uh, basically, I'm just going to rewrite C as G times C hat, where G is this powers of two matrix. So recall before that uh, it was just identity matrix times C. Here, I'm going to replace it with gadget matrix times C hat. So I'm going to replace C with its binary decomposition. And then G is this powers of two matrix. So again, I haven't done anything fancy. The only thing I've done is rewritten C as G times C hat. It turns out that this uh, representation of the linear system will actually be useful. So if we look at the, pre, uh, the, the general framework, the approach for constructing a commitment basically involves publishing a common reference string that has these components, the matrices A1 up to AL, these targets T1 up to TL, and then these cross terms, 
which are basically retarget AI to TJ. So that's what we did before. What we're going to do in this work is we're not going to publish these cross terms anymore. Instead, we're simply going to take this matrix on the left here, uh, this A's on A1 up to AL along the diagonal, concatenated with all of these G's. We're going to call this matrix B sub L. And our auxiliary data is not going to consist of these cross terms. It's simply going to be a full trapdoor for the matrix B sub L. So a full basis for the kernel of BL. And notice that if you have a trapdoor for a matrix, then uh, there's an efficient algorithm that allows us to sample a short solution. So short V1 of the VL and C hat to the linear system for any arbitrary target value Y here. So I can simply sample a short X such that B times X is equal to Y for any target Y. So what does this mean? The way that I'm going to commit now is I'm not going to take a linear combination of the target values anymore. The way I'm going to commit is I'm going to simply use the trapdoor to simultaneously sample the commitment C hat together with the opening V1 of the VL. So in the previous construction or the previous uh, approaches, the way that we construct the commitment is we take a linear combination of the targets. That's how we get the commitment. And the opening is defined to be a linear combination of uh, these short pre-images in the CRS. In our approach, we're not going to we're not going to decouple these two procedures anymore. Instead, we're going to do a joint sampling process where we jointly derive both the commitment and the opening together, right? Using a trapdoor that's provided in this common reference string. So we still have, at the end of the day, a set of commitments. Uh, sorry, a set of openings and a commitment that satisfies the verification relation for each i. We just have a very different way of sampling these things. So once we have done this, once we sampled a short solution to this linear system, the commitment will just be G times C hat. This is how we defined it before. And then V1 of the VL will be the openings. Notice that this has several interesting properties. Because the opening is no longer computed as a linear combination of things of short objects, this actually allows us to commit to arbitrary values over ZQ. In fact, because we have a full trapdoor for B sub L, it doesn't matter what is the target vector that I have on the right here. Could be a short vector, could be a long vector, doesn't matter. I can actually now commit and open to arbitrary values over ZQ. There's no norm requirement anymore. Secondly, because our commitment and openings are no longer deterministic processes, these are now in fact uh, doing that Gaussian pre-image sampling, we get hiding for free both the commitment and the opening actually hide the unopened positions. Basically, if you just characterize the distribution uh, that you get uh, from pre-image sampling, you can easily show that uh, the commitment is essentially a random Gaussian. And then the V1s of the VLs are sampled from the cosets uh, so as to satisfy the verification invariant. So uh, this approach gives you hiding commitments also for free. Uh, how do you prove security though? So this is where uh, our new assumption framework uh, will come into place. So I talked about correctness. Correctness just follows uh, by construction, right? I just sample the C and the Vs so as to satisfy the verification relation. So now let's analyze security. Suppose we have an adversary that can break binding. Namely, an adversary can commit to a vector and then open up the vector to two different values at two different positions. To prove that this scheme is binding, we're going to rely on a short integer solutions or the SIS assumption. So just to recall, the SIS assumption says, if I give you a random matrix A, it's hard to find a short X such that A times X is equal to zero. So I find a short X in the kernel of A. So if an adversary manages to break binding, that means the adversary is able to output a commitment C together with two openings, VI and VI prime, to values XI and XI prime such that they both satisfy this verification invariant. So it's AI times VI plus XI times TI, and it's also equal to AI times VI prime plus XI prime times TI. So suppose that the commitment and the opening satisfy this pair of equations. Then, uh, and the adversary is also given the matrices A1 up to AL, the targets T1 up to TL, and the trapdoor for B sub L. So, in a binding construction, I now need to tell you how we set 
the matrices, how we sample the matrices A and the target vectors T1 of the TF. So for correctness, not, none of this matters. I could have chosen any, any matrices A1 of the AL, any target T1 of the TL, and correctness will go through. For security, we have, it's going to be a little more delicate. So what we're going to do is we're going to sample the AIs to be uniform random. And we're going to set the target vectors TI to just be the first basis vector. So here, all of the targets are actually the same vector. It's literally the first basis vector. So one followed by all zeros. All of the target vectors have this particular form. So all the A's are uniform, random, and independent. But all the targets are equal and just equal to the first basis vector. So if you have an adversary now that is able to break binding, what that app, if you can just rearrange this equation to see that you basically get, if you subtract these two things, basically, you get A times the difference of the openings is equal to the difference of the values times E sub one. Now we know that Xi and Xi prime are distinct. So this is a non-zero value. So what has the adversary been able to do? The adversary has essentially been able to obtain an SIS solution to the matrix A sub I where the first row has been removed, right? Because the target vector here, notice, has, uh, has a one in the first position, but zero everywhere else. So this is really an SIS solution, just you drop the first row. But dropping the first row does not change the hardness of SIS, right? SIS was the first row removed in dimension n is just the SIS problem in dimension n minus one. So the assumption that we're going to use, uh, and this is the family of assumptions that we introduce in this work, which is this basis augmented SIS assumption or basis assumption, is basically saying that the SIS, that um, the adversary that can break binding will solve SIS with respect to A sub i. And we're going to assume then that SIS is as hard with respect to A sub i, even if I give out a trapdoor for this uh, related matrix. So this is why we call it basis augmented SIS, is basically SIS is hard with respect to a matrix A, even given a trapdoor for a related matrix uh, built from A. So in this case, the matrix B e sub L. So if this assumption holds, so let's just, uh, uh, for now, assume that this assumption holds, this actually allows us to prove the previous statement, right? We can use this assumption to simulate the CRS uh, in our functional commitment, in our vector commitment scheme, right? It gives us the matrices B A1 of the AL, and then the trapdoor for BL comes right from the assumption. So you, under the basis assumption, with this particular matrix, we can argue the hardness of our previous construction. But now you might ask, why should I believe that this assumption holds, right? This is not a standard looking assumption from lattices. Uh, what is the hardness of this assumption? It turns out that for this particular case, when the diagonal matrices here, when A1 up to A sub L here are just uniform and independent, we can actually reduce uh, the basis assumption from the, from the standard SIS assumption. So the hardness of standard SIS actually implies the hardness of this basis augmented SIS assumption. Uh, and the proof of this, which I won't have time to show today, uh, essentially follows from standard uh, lattice trapdoor extension techniques. Um, so if you basically, uh, the question is, how do you derive a trapdoor for B sub L uh, uh, from the SIS challenge? The way that you'll do it is you'll sample all of the other AIs uh, to be uniform random, uh, such that you know a trapdoor. And then using the trapdoors for all but one of these matrices, you can extend it to obtain a trapdoor for B sub L. So that's a very high level overview. But at the end of the day, uh, this version of the basis assumption actually reduces to SIS. And so using SIS, we get a vector commitment. David. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Do you lose all dimensions in this argument? Uh, no, you do not. So uh, basically, um, you get your SIS challenge in dimension n. You lose one dimension because we get SIS with the first row removed. Um, but uh, you do not lose a factor of L in the, in the reduction here. Yeah, so the idea is, uh, so here, here's a very quick idea of how to do it. Suppose I equals one. So I want to be able to generate a trapdoor for this matrix given SIS challenge for A sub one. I'm going to just simply sample all of the other matrices myself. And these will all be in dimension N with the knowledge of a trapdoor. And then what, basically what I can do is I will, let me see if I can draw. What I can do is I'm going to take this matrix right here 
without the first column block removed. I can use my trapdoor for A2 up to AL uh, to construct a trapdoor for the matrix I've outlined here. And then I can use lattice trapdoor extension to get it to extend it by one column over. So there's no loss in the, in the dimension, actually. Okay. Yeah. So happy to go into that uh, more in more detail offline if, interest, if that's interest. Okay. Cool. Okay. So just to summarize, uh, so here I've outlined a way to construct a vector commitment from the SIS assumption. Uh, the way it's structured is the common reference screen consists of these random matrices. And then the auxiliary data, instead of having short pre-images, is actually just a full trapdoor for the related uh, matrix. Uh, to commit, you simply sample jointly a set of openings and commitment that satisfies the verification relation. And the commitment and the openings are then directly derived from this pre-image. This allows us to commit uh, to arbitrary ZQ vectors. We get hiding for free, as I mentioned before. And this also is linearly homomorphic, similar to previous constructions. Namely, uh, if I take commitments to X and X prime, and I add them together, I get a commitment to X plus X prime, where the openings also uh, add. So here, the, the norm of the openings does grow slightly. So you can only do a bounded number of homomorphic operations. OK, so let's, to conclude now, I'm going to show that this framework actually generalizes very naturally to give a functional commitment to circuits. That uh, basically, just by uh, using structured matrices, our framework directly lifts to give a functional commitment for general circuits. Uh, so just to recall, the setting we're going to be considering is we're going to commit to a vector, and then we can open to an arbitrary function of the committed value. And here, the function it can be an arbitrary Boolean circuit. So uh, I'm going to assume the input now is 0, 1, and then f is an arbitrary Boolean circuit uh, on the input. And to do this, we're actually going to require some basic lattice machinery uh, for homomorphic computation. Uh, so I'm just going to very briefly recall the main notions from Gentry, Sahai, and Waters, and Bonet et al. for doing homomorphic computation on lattices. We're going to reuse a lot of the existing uh, machinery there. Uh, so basically, the homomorphic computation machinery and lattices can be summarized by a few, by a small number of key equations. Uh, so the first one is, uh, or the starting point is, I'm going to let this matrix A be a very wide matrix that has basically L blocks A1 up to AL associated with it. So L is the input length. So I'm going to have this very wide matrix that has basically a concatenation of L different blocks. Now, there's two functions that I can perform on this matrix A that are of importance. The first equation, or the first uh, relation, is what I call the input independent evaluation. So this relation takes the matrix A, it takes the description of the function f, and it produces a new function that I will call A sub f. OK, I'm not going to go into details of what this transformation does, but it basically does an evaluation of f on this matrix A, and it produces some matrix A sub f. The second relation that I want to uh, allude to is what I call the input dependent evaluation. So this takes the matrix A here. It takes the description of a function f, and it takes an input x, and it produces this homomorphic computation matrix, this h a sub f of x matrix. So OK, so this is not so interesting by itself. What's interesting is that you can do this homomorphic evaluation procedure. Uh, so in this relation, what I'm going to write is I'm going to write ai minus xi times g, where g, again, is this gadget matrix. This I'm going to refer to as an encoding of a value xi with respect to the matrix a sub i here. OK, so I'm going to encode xi with respect to a sub i. So now the way that you can interpret this homomorphic evaluation relation is that it's basically saying that if I have an encoding of x1 up to x sub l, so ai minus xig, and I multiply by h by this homomorphic evaluation matrix, I end up with an evaluation by with an encoding of f of x with respect to a sub f. So homomorphic evaluation takes an encoding of x, of the bits of x, and converts it into encoding of f of x. So this is the main machinery that we're going to use for constructing our functional commitment scheme. So now let me describe the construction. So the key idea is the following. Instead of using a random matrix A sub i, we're going to use a structured AI. But what is the structure? Well, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to define A sub I to be W I times A, where A is a uniform wide matrix and W1 and up to WL are invertible square matrices. The common reference ring then is exactly as before. It's basically a trap door for this basis, uh, for this matrix here. So you have the A's along a diagonal and the gadget uh, on the right. And to commit, I'm basically going to do something very similar. I'm going to use a trap door to jointly sample a set of openings and a commitment uh, that satisfies the uh, verification relation. The one difference that I'm going to make here is I'm going to choose my targets in a particular way. So before it was just x1 times t1, x2 times t2. Now I'm going to choose my target values to be wi times g uh, concatenated together. So notice the targets don't matter. I can target any value of my choosing. So I'm going to choose the structure of the targets so as to allow homomorphic computation. So the way that we're going to now uh, compute is now the following. So our commitment relation is just a short solution to this linear system. So what that means is that for all i, if I just read off the i plot uh, of this relation, I get a i times v i minus g times c hat is equal to x times w times g. This is, the, this is how I chose my target values. So let me just rewrite this equation uh, slightly. So recall that I chose my matrices a i to be structured. They're equal to w i times a. So I'll just do the substitution a i to w i times a. And next, I'm going to recall that the w i is actually an invertible matrix. So I can multiply both the left-hand side and the right-hand side by w i inverse. And what I end up with is a times v i minus w i inverse times g c equals minus x i times g. And if I rearrange, I can, uh, I'm just going to rewrite the equation. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to observe on the left-hand side here, this w i inverse times g times c hat. Observe that this is only a function of the commitment. It's only a function of C uh, and WI, but WI is part of the common reference string. This is known to the verifier. So the verifier can actually compute C tilde of I, which is exactly this quantity here. So we can rewrite this as C tilde of I minus XI times G is exactly equal to A times VI. This looks awfully a lot like an encoding on the, on the left-hand side, right? This is an encoding of XI with respect to uh, uh, the matrix C tilde of I. OK, <clears throat> so the way that you can view this is that if you're familiar with the, with the construction of Gentry's to high waters, uh, this is essentially a homomorphic encryption. This is an encryption, this is a ciphertext that encrypts Xi, where the randomness is exactly V sub I. Or you can view it actually as a homomorphic commitment under the framework of Gorbanov by Kutunathan and Wicks. This is a commitment to Xi, where the opening is V sub I. Uh, so just to compare with the homomorphic commitments that I mentioned before, uh, in, whole, in, in uh, Gorbanov, Akuntanath, and Wicks construction, the commitment openings are actually uniform. Uh, so we actually have uh, independent commitments. This yields a very long commitment scheme, where you have a mate where that grows linearly with the length of the input, but you get security from SIS. And in our work, the way that what we're basically doing is we're publishing a trap door that allows you to jointly sample the commitment and the openings together and to basically derive them from a single short commitment C hat. So instead of having independent commitments, we're using a trap door to compress all of the commitments into a single short commitment C hat. This leads to a short commitment, namely a functional commitment, but will require a stronger assumption, which I'll introduce shortly. So I, no I noticed that I'm running a little bit low on time. So let me skip the homomorphic evaluation process here. Let me just say that this basically, because we have the same structure as the homomorphic commitment of Gorbachev, by Kuntanathan, and Weeks, the same kind of homomorphic evaluation machinery that written down on the left here directly applies uh, and allows us to uh, construct a opening to an arbitrary function of uh, the input f. Okay. So the security is what's more interesting. The security now reduces to the basis assumption. So this basis augmented SIS assumption, except now with a structured matrix. Basically, the assumption states that the SIS problem is hard with respect to the matrix A, even if I give you a trapdoor, namely a basis for the matrix 
uh, defined as such, right? So the structure is exactly the same as before, except now the AIs are structured. It's WI times A. So this is a falsifiable assumption, but as far as we know, we don't know how to reduce it to the standard SIS assumption. Now, I will note that the, sort of the trivial case where L equals one, where I have a single, single, single row, this does follow from SIS, but this is not a very interesting uh, scenario. And it's a really, really interesting open problem in my mind to better understand this assumption. Can we get better attacks? Like maybe is the assumption broken uh, when L is bigger than one? Or can we try and give a reduction to the SIS assumption uh, when uh, L is bigger than one? So right now I don't have a, I don't really have a good sense for which is more likely. Uh, I'm leaning towards that this is likely to be a, a sound assumption. But again, I think this is a really interesting target uh, for cryptanalysis. Uh, that is SIS hard, even if I give you some related information, a trapdoor for a related matrix. So this is the reason why I call uh, these new assumptions like a Q-type generalization of SIS. I'm giving you the SIS problem, but I'm also giving you some hints uh, for a related uh, problem. Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, in this uh, here, I've introduced this functional commitment for lattices. Uh, basically, it's the same framework as we use to build our vector commitments, but now using structured matrices rather than random matrices. The auxiliary data is still a trapdoor for the related matrix. So to commit, you jointly sample a uh, opening and a commitment to satisfy the verification relation. And uh, this in turn allows you to construct a functional commitment that supports all functions computable by a bounded depth Boolean circuit. So the size of the CRS is quadratic in uh, the length of the input. So it has a very big CRS. This is an interesting question to reduce the size of the CRS. Uh, but once you, have once you have the CRS, the size of the commitment and the size of the openings are both small. They grow only polynomially in a security parameter, polylogarithmically in the length of the input, uh, polylogarithmic, uh, but also polynomially in the depths of the circuit. So there is a depth dependence in the, in the computation. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is that the verification time for the commitment scheme actually does scale uh, linearly with the size of the function. So the verifier basically has to do this homomorphic computation uh, when it comes to checking uh, the circuit. It turns out that with pre-processing, you can actually uh, reduce the verification time. Uh, so the reason that the verification time right now is very long is because the verifier has to do this homomorphic computation process. It has to take the commitment, expand it into the commitment of the bits, and then homomorphically evaluate the function on those bits. But uh, in cases where the function f is known in advance, so for instance, let's say, and the function has special structure, for instance, if f is a linear function, then it turns out that what you can do is you can actually pre-compute this c tilde of f you can basically separate it into something that can be computed in the offline phase and something that can be computed in the online phase. So uh, I went through this very quickly, but the basic idea that I want to outline is that if the function f is known in advance and moreover f has special structure, say it's a linear function, the verification time can actually, the online verification time can actually run in time that's independent of the depth of the function or independent of the size of the function by using free computation. Okay, and the reason that linear functions are interesting is because they capture both vector commitments and polynomial commitments. Uh, polynomial commitments, namely because polynomial evaluation can be described by a linear function. Okay, so just to summarize uh, in this talk, I presented a new methodology for constructing lattice-based commitments. Uh, the, method, the idea is as follows. We start with the verification relation C, and we basically publish a trapdoor for the linear system defined by our verification relation. The security of our construction in turn relies on this new basis augmented SIS assumption, which essentially is a family of assumptions that says SIS with respect to A is hard, even if I give you a trapdoor for a related matrix B. The random variant of the basis assumption uh, where the matrices in B are all random, these imply vector commitments and reduces directly to the standard SIS assumption. Whereas the structured variant of the assumption uh, can be used to get functional commitments. So this gives us linear and polynomial commitments that also support fast pre-processing uh, verification and can also be used to get aggregate uh, commitments. So basically here, 
you imagine you want to open to k different positions, can you do so with a commitment whose size scales sublinearly with k? So using our structured uh, basis assumption, uh, we also uh, are able to support aggregate openings. So I'll leave you with a couple open questions. So the first is, uh, analyzing this new basis family of assumptions, can we give new reductions to SIS? Can we give better attacks uh, on this basis assumption? I think uh, both of these are very interesting. Uh, the second is, can we get functional commitments for general circuits that has uh, verification in the pre-processing model? So the previous construction of l et al. actually does do it for constant degree polynomials, but can we do it for general circuits? Uh, can we formulate knowledge variants of the assumption or the construction that allows us to satisfy stronger notions of uh, soundness? So this will be useful for getting applications to succinct non-interactive arguments. Uh, can we formulate suitable assumptions, knowledge assumptions over lattices uh, that are plausibly true? So it turns out that this uh, it seems to be fairly challenging. At least a lot of the natural versions of the assumptions that we've written down uh, in the knowledge setting turns out to be insecure. And finally, do we have a hope of reducing the CRS size? Namely, can we try to obtain a functional commitment where the size of the common reference string is only linear in the input length, or better, sublinear in the input length? So far, we don't have a way to do so. And with that, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up. So, uh, And I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you, David. I ask you about uh, if you looked at the SNARP construction from your commitment scheme, and if yes, how would it compare? Uh, have you also looked at the how does it compare to this other data? Yeah, yeah. A great question. Yeah, so so we haven't so we tried to formulate some natural looking knowledge versions of the assumption, uh, but at least the, the simplest versions uh, seem to be broken. Uh, so we don't have a way to uh, we don't have a clean knowledge assumption under which we can prove the security of our construction. We could conjecture that the construction itself is itself is already a snark. So just instantiate the construction, let's say for quadratic polynomials, uh, and just conjecture that 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 is a snark. Uh, currently, it's we don't a, have an attack. Designated, on that. It's designated verifier snark, right? Uh, no, no. This will be publicly verifiable. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, it will follow the framework that I described before because the commitment is publicly verifiable, right? So the yes. prover would commit to the witness, and then they would just open uh, to uh, the empty relation evaluated on the witness. So this will give you a publicly verifiable snark. Uh, mm -hmm. And in, co in comparison with outbreak that how construction, we would have a quadratic reduction in the CRS size. So in outbreak detail, the size of the CRS is basically uh, C to the four, where C is the length of the, is the size of the circuit. Uh, in our case, the size of the CRS would be quadratic in a circuit size. So still uh, very large and not very efficient, uh, but there is, a, there is some savings that you can get. Uh, on the flip side, we don't, have a, we don't have a clean knowledge assumption that we can use for arguing security other than just conjecturing that the scheme is secure as is. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, very interesting to, to formulate a, a suitable knowledge assumption that's not, uh, uh, that's not uh, certainly false. <laughs> mm -hmm. The question is more question like the commitment schemes uh, follow, like how, how would hierarchy go in? Like, uh, sorry, I, I didn't quite get, uh, get the last part of the question. Could you repeat it? Okay. Uh, so uh, the commitment schemes, how the hierarchy goes, like ID schemes, signature schemes. So how it was uh, signature schemes followed by the the ID scheme. So how it goes, like hierarchy going. Uh, what do you mean by the hierarchy? Schemes? So 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 the commitments. So we all we, we what we get is a functional commitment. Uh, I, I, you're asking whether we can use this to get like a, a analog for signature or encryption. Is that the question? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Like, right, right. So yeah. the, I don't think there's any direct implication. So for instance, a functional commitment. So if you use it to build, build a snark, you can get a generalized version of a signature. Um, but as far as I can tell, functional commitments do not directly imply the notions like functional encryption uh, or, uh, or, or the version for signatures. Yeah, there's no direct implication. Uh, you may be able to use uh, some of the similar tools or similar machinery 
uh, to build it directly and algebraically, but I don't think there's a, there's a simple and direct implication right here. And all the commitment schemes, like the, the functional commitments are concatenated to the compressed uh, the string is there. What like, do you mean? Uh, so uh, the the commitment is scheme. Yeah. So, um, the openings is mm -hmm. concatenated. Uh, string is or the fun it's used as a functional evaluation. That's right. That's right. So if you want, so so the, I guess you sh you don't have to view it as being concatenated. The way that you can view the model is I can commit to an input x and I give you my commitment. And later on, I can open it to many different functions uh, of the committed value. So I can open it to a function f1, and then you learn f1 of x. And then later on, I might say, OK, I also want to open to a function f2, uh, and then you learn f2 of x together with the opening. Uh, so in, uh, in, a, in the application to snarks, uh, the, it would be the commitment is concatenated together with the opening. But as a more general primitive, if you're just doing like a proof on committed data, I can commit to my data once. And then later on, when somebody makes a query to me, uh, I might uh, provide an opening for the query evaluated on my data. So in these cases, the commitment and the openings uh, are not always uh, generated together. Uh, and in fact, uh, you get the flexibility of choosing what you want to open uh, in, a, in an online fashion. So the user can specify, I want an opening for this particular function, and then I can provide such an opening after it has been requested. Any other questions on Zoom, maybe? Okay, if not, then let's thank David again. Thank you, David. It was a great presentation. Great. Thanks a lot for having me. Cool. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Cool. Excellent.